Good evening, or good morning, as the case may be. May grace be upon you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to another broadcast in our series from the Gospel according to St. John. And uh, this is a ministry of the Providence Anglican Church. Uh, located in Pluit and Karawachi here on the island of Java and also in Changu, Bali. So wherever you're tuning in from, we're very happy to have you joining us. We're on John chapter 3 this week and uh, I just thought I might start out with a story as we uh, as we get started and uh, the story is from a, a fellow named Arnold Fruchtenbaum what a name he was a uh, kind of a Orthodox Jewish refugee from the uh, from behind the Iron Curtain who escaped to the West and uh, he had quite the uh, Yiddish sense of humor they had bribed the Russian border guards with American cigarettes. And so he said, uh, while well, cigarette smoking might be bad for your health, I can tell you it was very good for hours that night. And he said, that was one night I really did walk a mile for a camel. You're old enough to remember the old camel commercials. You'll appreciate that reference. Well, when uh, Arnold was in the uh, refugee camps in Austria, I believe it was, uh, he bumped into some uh, Americans who gave him their uh, name and phone number and they said, if you ever do make it to the United States, uh, you get to New York, give us a call. And so uh, when Arnold arrived in New York, he gave them a call and uh, they got together and uh, they invited Arnold to a Bible study. I don't think he had realized that they were believers in Jesus. And Arnold was an Orthodox Jew, uh, trained uh, in that tradition by his father. But he continued going anyway. And he just found himself entirely absorbed in the New Testament. And some of his friends saw him with that book uh, tucked under his arm and they said Arnold what are you doing that's a Gentile book what are you what are you doing with that and he said no this is not a Gentile book he said the Gentiles could never come up with something this good and uh, sometimes in the Christian world we can tend to forget that the New Testament is a very, very Jewish book. Uh, the, the early, earliest Christians were Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And uh, there's a saying, the, the Old Testament is in the New Revealed. The New Testament is in the Old Concealed. And uh, as we study the Gospel according to St. John, I think it's uh, important to remind ourselves that unless we understand the Old Testament, what in the days of Jesus was not called the Old Testament, but was simply called the, the Scripture, or the Bible, um, the, the Torah and the writings of the prophets, the Psalms and so forth, they were the Bible of the apostles and of Jesus. And um, when we read the New Testament, we cannot just read it as if we're starting from scratch. I mean, you can read it any way you like, but you are bound to misunderstand it if you don't understand the Old Testament context of almost everything that Jesus says.
uh, I'll just tell one little joke on myself. I can remember uh, when I was much younger driving through Philadelphia and seeing on a synagogue, um, love your neighbor as yourself. And I was so surprised that they had one of Jesus's sayings up on the synagogue. And of course, that displayed my own ignorance because Jesus was quoting the Old Testament when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, tonight we want to open up our Bibles to John 3. And if you're studying along, I, I recommend that you use the English Standard Version. That's a very uh, good version to use for careful study. Um, but uh, use whatever you'd like. I will be referencing, referencing the English Standard Version. And uh, it's a fairly word-for-word -word translation. I should also just let you know that there are two commentaries that I've found uh, to be helpful. Uh, one is F.F. F. Bruce, uh, his book, the, the Gospel and Epistles of John. And uh, this is a really easy and accessible book for almost anybody. Uh, and then there's another one that is maybe of more use to scholarly types, and that is uh, the Gospel According to John by D.A. Carson, uh, reckoned by some to be the finest uh, New Testament scholar uh, in the, uh, within at least the more uh, conservative part of the, of the spectrum. And uh, for my money, he's the best anywhere. And so, uh, D.A. Carson, The Gospel According to St. John. Not easy reading, but if you uh, really desire to dig deep, he's the man for you. And uh, you can also find some of his lectures on John, and especially on John chapter 3, in the, uh, on the internet. Just Google D.A. Carson, Gospel According to St. John on YouTube, and some excellent lectures will come up. And I should mention in that vein that John MacArthur, uh, always a thorough man, you may not agree with him on every single point, but um, one thing you can be sure of is that he has studied it out carefully and researched it well and knows the background and the, the, uh, the, the cultural aspects of the, of the text. And so his lectures, his online lectures on the Gospel according to St. John, and, and specifically on John chapter 3, are very helpful. Now, enough uh, of these preliminaries. Let's get down to business. Um, I have thought of shortening these talks. Uh, we did a live Bible study uh, two nights ago, and uh, one of my close friends was uh, honest enough to tell me, TMI. Jim, too much information. And uh, John is a dense book. So I thought about maybe uh, taking a different take on these uh, talks, and maybe uh, maybe next time I will get around to doing it. I'm thinking of calling it Break 1-9. Do you remember the old CB radio, Break 1-9, good buddy? And uh, to shoot for about a 19-minute uh, discussion. Um, I don't think we'll be that short tonight, but let's see how we do. Because I think I'm just going to take one small piece of this passage that we didn't cover last time. But let's, let, let's take the time at least to read this passage again. And um, so uh, please open your Bibles to John chapter 3. And may God uh, enable us to truly understand his holy and inspired word. John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, 
for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, we're going to stop here tonight. Let me review very uh, briefly and uh, I hope succinctly that in our last uh, broadcast, we tackled the question of what Nicodemus should have known that he didn't know. Uh, we reminded you that, that Nicodemus was not just any old teacher, but that he was someone that Jesus could call the teacher of Israel. And so uh, probably he held a very high position in the uh, authority structure uh, of this group called the Pharisees, who were very, very strict in their observance of the Jewish laws and regulations, and uh, very meticulous in keeping God's laws uh, perfectly. And uh, Jesus doesn't fault them for that, certainly not. Uh, what, he, what he disagrees with the Pharisees about is really two things. One is that they tend to have an outward righteousness and outward conformity to the letter of the law, but it has not touched their hearts. And so they end up being hypocritical. He says, it's, you're like a cup that is clean and shiny on the outside, but inside it's nasty stuff. And uh, so that's one of the problems that Jesus has with the Pharisees. Uh, we noticed last week that Nicodemus came at night and that he uh, addressed the, the meeting with Jesus using uh, what we sometimes call in English the royal we. And we noticed that he was hiding in two ways. He was hiding in that he came at night when no one else could see him. And he was hiding behind his group association. By using the term we, he is uh, strengthening his position. And Jesus kind of picks that up in a, uh, in a what I think is a kind of an acerbically humorous way. And Jesus responds with the same type of language. He also says, we. Uh, the key thing that Nicodemus is uh, engaged with Jesus over uh, in the beginning of this discussion, and indeed throughout the discussion, is this idea of a new birth. Uh, 
I told you that in John, uh, chapter one kind of lays out the skeleton of where he's going to go in the rest of the gospel. And so, uh, surprise, surprise, in John chapter one, uh, the new birth is referred to. Uh, it's called being born of God. And uh, John tells us in his role as narrator that um, Jesus came to his own, but his own uh, in general, or the leaders, is what he's talking about most specifically, did not receive him. But he immediately uh, jumps back that there were those who did receive him, and as many as did receive him, uh, they're just a remnant, but there were those who received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. Children not born through ordinary means, uh, but born of God. And so it's chapter 3 then where we see this um, concept of being born of God or being born again or being born of water and the Spirit um, unpacked. Uh, and But yet to say that it's unpacked, it, it really is not completely unpacked until the end, but Jesus implies that Nicodemus should have known what he was talking about. And Nicodemus maintains a stance of ignorance throughout this discussion. And at a certain point, he stops asking questions and is quiet, and Jesus just takes over and talks on. So uh, from the point that Jesus asks him, you're the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Um, that's the last time that we hear uh, Nicodemus talk in this section. From now on, Jesus is doing all the talking, and Nicodemus is left just to listen to him talk. Now, in our last... Um, talk, we looked at this question of what Nicodemus should have known that he didn't know. And of course, if he's a Bible teacher and there's something that he should have known but didn't know, it's a good guess that what he should have known was in the material that a Bible teacher should be master of. And so indeed, we look back to Ezekiel chapter 36, where the language is all about something new that God is going to do. Uh, he's going to uh, wash them. He's going to sprinkle them with clean water and, and cleanse them. So they're going to get a, a fresh start in that respect. But he goes on to say that he's going to give them a new spirit, that he's going to give them a new heart, that he's going to take their hard heart and give them a soft heart. And we notice that God is doing this all uh, monergistically. That means he is doing it himself. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. And the reason that God will is because Israel had not. God's law was perfect. The law that God gave us through Moses on Mount Sinai was perfect flawless, but the people were not. And so uh, an imperfect people had this perfect law, but they could never keep it. And so what happened was that they went astray. And finally, God said, okay, um, you guys have failed to do this. So I'm going to create a new system. Um, there's going to be a new, um, a new arrangement because you guys have messed up this covenant that I gave you and I'm going to fix it. And because I fix it, it will work. And so we looked at that last time. But now this week, we want to look at just, just this one little piece 
which is where Jesus says, if I have told you earthly things and you did, do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So here's one of those uh, contrasts for which John is known. We talked last week about light and darkness. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the dark. And uh, in verse, um, verse 21 of this passage, we will see that whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may, may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so maybe, just maybe, that is a, uh, a kind of a rebuke to Nicodemus who has come in the dark. But at the same time, we have to be honest enough to say that Nicodemus has at least come to Jesus, who is the light. And so maybe, maybe there's a chance for him yet. And uh, if we follow the story through to the very end, we'll see it at the very end. As we said last week, Nicodemus does finally come into the light and acknowledge Jesus in a public way and uh, honor him in a public way while it's still daytime. But right now he's still in the dark. And so here's the contrast we're gonna deal with tonight. Not light and darkness, but heaven and earth. If I've told you about earthly things, uh, a covenant that, that, that God is to unfold on the earth, and uh, you don't even understand that, then how can I tell you about heavenly things? And so now Jesus launches into a discussion which, again, can only really be understood if we understand the Old Testament. And so let's begin with this. Verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So we're going to look at two Old Testament passages uh, that talk about this ascension and descension and the first is in the book of proverbs and it's a very curious passage that that well all scripture is supernaturally put together but we don't expect well, maybe it's my own failure i don't usually expect to find in the book of proverbs uh, a, a prophetic aspect that points to Jesus in such a clear way as this one seems to. So just give this a listen. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 3 and 4. Who has, well, he starts off by saying, I have not learned wisdom, and I have no knowledge of the Holy One. Who is the Holy One? That's God. And then verse 4 begins with this question, who does have knowledge of the Holy One? Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Okay, to come down is another word for descend. Who has gone up to heaven and who has come down? Uh, and the idea is to, to, to tell us something that they have seen uh, firsthand about God. Who? Who has ascended to heaven and come down? And then he goes on, who has gathered the wind in his hands? Who has bound up the waters in his cloak? Who has established the ends of the earth? Well, we know the creation story in Genesis, and we've heard it repeated in John with a little twist. He told us in chapter 1 that Jesus was there in the beginning, that he was with God and that he was God and that all things were made through him, and apart from him was nothing made which has been made. And so he is with God, and he was God, yet he can be distinguished from God. And how does this work? Well, listen to the, the end of this proverb. What is his name, and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Let me read the whole thing together again. I have not learned wisdom, and I have no knowledge of the Holy One, who has ascended to heaven and come down, who has gathered the 
wind in his hands? Who has bound up the waters in his cloak? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son? Surely you know. Do you know? Very interesting, isn't it? That he asks this question, what is the name of his son? The name of whose son? Of the one who established the ends of the earth. Now this is the Old Testament. Who is this son of God that's being talked about here? And so Jesus picks up this language and he says no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the son of man okay no one has been to heaven except the one who came down from heaven the son of man and so let's take the clue from this word son of man when I was in seminary, we read all kinds of uh, commentaries about this phrase, Son of Man. And I'm sorry to say that, that I was kind of taken up with some of the interpretations that they were giving. And the interpretations were logical. They were, they were uh, well, well uh, thought out. But they neglected to really root themselves in the Jewishness of Jesus, who is not just philosophizing, but is quoting the Old Testament. And so what we want to find out is, who is the Son of Man in the Old Testament? And does he ascend or descend? To heaven or is there something that we could learn from the Old Testament that would help us to understand this and so indeed no surprise there is a passage in Daniel Daniel chapter 7 and so let's let's look at Daniel chapter 7 Jeremiah Lamentations Ezekiel and Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, here's what we read. Daniel is having a vision, a miraculous supernatural vision. As I looked, thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Now, in modern times, we are judged by judges, but in the ancient times, the king sat in judgment, at least for important cases. And this is a picture of the king of heaven sitting down on his throne, and the books are open, the record books are open, and he's ready to judge. Now, Daniel chapter 7, I just read to you verses 9 and 10. But now I want to skip over to verse 13. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a, are you listening, son of man. So here is one of the places in Daniel that we read about someone who is like a son of man. The other place we're going to see one like a son of man is when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are put into the flaming furnace. And the king looks and he sees that there are not three men, but a fourth one is with them. And he 
looks like a son of man. That means he looks like a descendant of Adam. He looks like a human being. He looks like a, 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 a man. But it doesn't say that he is a man. It says that he is like a son of man. And so, behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so this is a, an Old Testament passage that gives us a very clear picture of what a Jewish person at the time of Jesus would have thought about when he heard the phrase son of man their mind would not have gone immediately to the speculative ideas of the modern Bible scholars their mind would have gone back to this vivid imagery that captures the imagination of every boy and uh, probably of every girl in Sunday school the stories from the book of Daniel who could ever forget them having once read them and so um, here's the interesting thing this passage was written in Aramaic most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the entire New Testament at least any copies that we have of it the originals are in Greek, not that we have the originals, but the oldest copies of the New Testament that we have are written in Greek. And the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, but some parts were written in Aramaic. And so uh, let me just uh, tell you in a moment why that's important. But first notice that this one, like a son of man, is standing there at the throne of God and God gives him dominion okay uh, in Latin the word for Lord is Domini uh, in Holland the pastors are given that honorific title Domini my Lord as if they were part of the nobility and uh, here is a dominion a dominion is an area ruled over by a domini, and so this is a realm ruled over by a noble lord. And he's given glory, and he's given a kingdom. So he's not merely a noble, but he is a king, because only a king has a kingdom. And in this dominion, in this kingdom, all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him and so we see here a picture of the Messiah that the Jewish people would have immediately thought of the Messiah when they heard this term son of man but notice that um, this this Messiah known as the son of man is much bigger than the Messiah that the disciples I think still had in mind even on the day of the ascension when they say to Jesus, Lord, is it at this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, uh, Jesus kind of uh, puts their question off. He tells them it's not for you to know the times and seasons that, that God has set. But you guys wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. And when it comes, then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, why to the uttermost parts of the earth? Well, because their kingdom was too small. 
they, they weren't thinking uh, too big when they asked about the, the kingdom being restored to Israel. Their thoughts were too small because in telling them that they are to go to, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth, what I believe Jesus is saying, although I doubt if they understood it at that moment, uh, was that his kingdom is going to encompass not just the Jewish nation, but all peoples, as all ethnic groups, all nations, all, all national identities, all languages. You know, there are nations that have people of different, look at Indonesia, how many different uh, languages, uh, hundreds of languages uh, spoken across the archipelago here. But every single language group will be under the dominion of Christ, the Son of Man. And notice that it says that they will serve him. They'll be under him that they should serve him. And this word for serve, it's, it's probably not the, I'm not sure why they translate it this way. In the book, uh, in, the, in the Aramaic language, this word serve actually means to worship. And so we think of the worship service, right? Sometimes we call it the liturgy, sometimes we call it the worship service. Uh, the work of the people in worship is what liturgy means. Um, so it is given by God to this one, like a son of man, that all nations will worship him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so whatever is starting here is going to go on forever. And um, so this is the Son of Man that, that Jesus brings to mind when he mentions Son of Man. But notice also that the Son of Man in this story uh, comes to the Ancient of Days. Um, through the clouds of heaven. Now, think about this. Normally, when we think of someone coming through the clouds of heaven, we think of them coming down. But if God dwells above the heavens, then this one, like a son of man, would be coming up through the clouds. He would be ascending to the throne of God. But then he is given dominion over all the peoples, languages, and nations who live on earth. And so he would then come down to take dominion over the nations that God has given to worship him. So I think that here in this Old Testament passage, we have the kernel of the problem. See, the problem that that many of us have with the idea that the Messiah is to be worshipped is not a New Testament problem. It's a problem that already exists in the Old Testament. It just becomes more obvious in the New Testament. How can the nations worship this one like a son of man unless he's God because to worship anyone other than God is idolatry sacrilege and yet it is the ancient of days God himself who ordains that all peoples all nations all language groups should worship him and uh, what happens on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is sent down and uh, the people are sprinkled and have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, what happens? They immediately begin to speak in 
all different languages, of all different ethnic groups and nations. And what do they hear? They hear them proclaiming the glory of God in their own languages. So that pretty much brings us to the conclusion of, of tonight's lesson, because if I go on to the next uh, piece, uh, you will probably go to sleep, and I might even uh, be asleep by then. But no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And next time we will deal with verse 14, which is this third Old Testament image which is brought to light here, the second one that's, that's brought to light, um, obviously. Uh, the Ezekiel passage is not as obvious, although it's very much what Nicodemus should have known. But the passage from Proverbs and Daniel is obvious. When the Jews heard Jesus say these words, they would have thought of Proverbs 30, and they would have thought of Daniel 7. And now Jesus is going to introduce in verse 14 a third Old Testament image from the story of the children of Israel uh, in the Exodus. And so we'll, we'll tackle that next time. But again, we we see in verse 13 that while Jesus may have been born in Bethlehem, he did not begin in Bethlehem. He descended. He came to earth. Um, he became incarnate. But to become incarnate, he already had to be. Um, and so you have another indication here of the divine nature of the Christ. He was with God before anything was made, and uh, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom that will last forever. And so like God, the Son of Man, the Christ, goes forever in both directions. He, like God the Father has no beginning and no end. That's, uh, that's a wrap, I think, for tonight. Let's, uh, let me bless you and, uh, and then say goodbye. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us now and forever. Amen.